Hello everyone and welcome. I'm not really a big fan of turbochargers because from a driving perspective, they're not really ideal. But I recently drove the Porsche 911 Turbo S and Porsche uses a really clever solution here in what coincidentally is the quickest car I've ever tested. Flying from 0 to 60 miles per hour in just 2.5 seconds the first time I tried it in sport mode. It's bonkers fast, and it uses really clever turbocharger technology. In fact, back in 2006, the Porsche Turbo was the very first gasoline production car to use variable geometry turbochargers, and it still uses them today. It's brilliant tech and one of the best mechanical solutions to turbocharging, so how does it work? So to start off, we need to talk about why turbochargers suck. And they kind of do. I mean, they suck in air through the intake. That's for the dads out there. I'm not a father. But the real problem with turbochargers is that the process takes time. They're not as responsive as engines that are naturally aspirated or perhaps supercharged. And so why does this happen? Well, if you look at your throttle, you've got atmospheric pressure sitting on one end, you know, the atmosphere, the air that we're all uh, hanging out in. And then on the other side, you've got your engine and you're gonna send that air into that engine. So when you floor it and you open up this throttle valve, well, that atmospheric air then rushes in. Then that air is burned within the combustion chamber, it goes through the exhaust and starts to spool up this turbocharger, which then starts to pull in more air, forces it through the compressor side of the turbocharger, through the intercooler to cool it down, and then stuffs it in the engine. And then you start to make more exhaust so you can spool this up faster, so you can pull in more air, so you can stuff more air in the engine and make more power. Again, this process takes time. It's not a snap of your fingers. When you open that throttle, you don't immediately have all that pressure stuffed inside of the engine, so you lose response. And that's a lame driving experience when you have to wait when you put your foot down to when you actually get power. So what do you do about this? Well, there's some decision making that you can do in order to change the responsiveness characteristics of a turbocharger. So if you select a small turbocharger, well, then it's going to be fairly restrictive in the exhaust. But that restriction means you're going to have high exhaust velocities and spool up that turbocharger wheel very quickly and thus have a responsive turbocharged engine. The downside, uh, is that your torque is gonna to fall off as you get to higher RPM because that exhaust is so restrictive. So good for low RPM torque and good for that really quick response, but unfortunately that small turbo is going to, you know, kind of fade off as you get into really high RPM. So for a high RPM application where you want big power, you might choose to use a big turbocharger which doesn't have uh, as much restriction going through it. So you can flow a lot of exhaust through it and that gives you high power with low back pressure, but it means that turbocharger is gonna take a long time to spool up and it may not spool up until higher RPMs. So you may have to wait until those later RPMs to get good power. So what does Porsche do? Well, they use a BorgWarner variable turbine geometry turbo. And this turbo has adjustable vanes surrounding that turbine wheel. And so you can adjust the angle of these vanes and change the amount of back pressure that you have within this turbo. So if you position these vanes so that they have a really small gap, this is great for low exhaust flow because it creates a restriction and thus forces that air passing through the vanes to speed up and thus spools up your turbocharger really quickly. So you have high back pressure, but you have high velocity and you get that thing to be very responsive. Of course, once that turbocharger spools up, you don't want to have it be really restrictive. So you then open up those vanes and allow for more space between them so that you now have less restriction through the turbocharger and you can get high power and high flow through it in an efficient manner. Now, it's worth pointing out that there's not simply two settings here. It's not just super restrictive or super open. You can vary anywhere in between. However, you're not gonna stay at this small gap position very long because once you start spooling that turbo up, it immediately becomes restrictive. So most of the time, if you're using a good amount of throttle, it's gonna be in the mid to open position to allow for less restrictive exhaust flow and maximize power and efficiency. So the first use in passenger cars with variable turbine geometry was in 1997 using diesel engines. But it wasn't until nearly a full decade later that it was put into a gasoline vehicle, the Porsche Turbo. And it's still fairly rare to be used in gasoline engines. So why did it take so long to get put into gasoline engines and why is it still rare to see? So the big challenge with gasoline engines is that the exhaust temperatures are significantly higher than diesels. So diesel exhaust temperatures can be 
be around 800 to 850 degrees C versus a gasoline exhaust temperature around 1000 to 1050 degrees C or about 200 degrees Celsius higher. I spoke with BorgWarner engineers and they told me about the two main challenges plus one more uh, that are associated with these high exhaust gas temperatures in gasoline engines. So first of all, you have to deal with creep. So that's the material elongation over time. This isn't related to thermal expansion. It's a separate thing. It's basically the permanent elongation of certain parts and it's more prominent when you get into really high temperatures. Of course, that's an issue if you have these really small, fine controlled parts and you need to make sure they're never binding and always doing the proper thing. You also run into oxidation and corrosion as an issue when you start to get into really high temperatures. And finally, you have thermal expansion. So you have these really small parts, and then of course there's larger parts when you're looking at this item, and some of these parts you know, are gonna warm up quicker than others. So you need to make sure that no binding occurs within it. One of the interesting things Borgwinner also said was that the soot in diesel exhaust actually acts like a lubricant. Uh, of course, you don't want too much, but some of that diesel soot actually acts like a lubricant uh, for this variable turbine geometry. So it's kind of neat uh, that there's a benefit there to that diesel soot uh, with the turbocharger. Again, you don't want too much, but a slight help there. And so one of the things that makes all of this very challenging is that it's difficult to find materials that satisfy all of these requirements. So I was asking BorgWarner engineers about what some of the unique materials might be and they told me about PM2000. This is an iron alloy that's very difficult to obtain. Go ahead and Google it and try and see if you can buy some. It's difficult to acquire. Uh, it's a very rare, very expensive material, uh, but it has really good properties. So it's super strong, it doesn't have creep, and it has minimal thermal elongation. So it's perfectly suited in this application. But again, that means it's expensive, right? And so if this is a complicated, expensive, thing, then it makes it less likely to be prevalent within gasoline engines. That's less of an issue when we're talking about a $200,000 sports car. So in this specific application, we have a 3.7 liter six cylinder. Uh, some may refer to it as a 3.8 cylinder, uh, but it is not. It's 3.745 liters. Uh, so four, you know, would round down as a 3.7 liter engine. So 640 horsepower at 6,750 RPM, 590 pound feet at 2,500 to 4,000 RPM. And that range may not seem all that great, but consider at 6,750 RPM, where it's hitting peak power, it's still has nearly 500 pound-feet of torque. Now this engine has a redesigned air intake system and the routing is pretty interesting. For the engine there are four air intakes, one on each side panel and then one additional intake on the sides of the intercoolers. So that air makes its way through the filters, which are located in the rear fenders, through the compressor side of the turbocharger, through the intercoolers to cool it down, through the throttle valve, into the intake manifold, across, and then down and into the cylinders, and then finally out the exhaust through the turbocharger, and then out the exhaust on the back of the vehicle. Now, because it's turbocharged, we need intercoolers. So these draw in air from the top surface of the car, and then it passes down and through the two intercoolers. The air exits in four locations. Two of the exits are directly below the intercooler, leaving through the middle of the bottom of the rear bumper. But there are two more exits on each side to assist with airflow. Porsche says the intercoolers are 14% larger than the previous model and have a 13% increase in cooling air flowing through them thanks to the new design. The new air intakes, located in the rear fenders, have a larger cross-sectional area and thus offer lower resistance and greater engine efficiency. It also has electronic wastegates for the turbochargers. One benefit is when you cold start the engine, the wastegates are completely open, so your exhaust gases essentially bypass the turbochargers and go directly to the catalytic converters to heat them up quicker. Now the exhaust routing has also been updated to allow for a symmetrical design of the turbos. So instead of the previous generation where we had our exhaust come out and then the turbochargers were spinning in the same direction, now because again they're on opposite sides of the engine, you have a much cleaner flow where you don't have this kink and then rerouting of that airflow, so you've got less drag for your turbochargers there. They've also increased the size of the turbine wheel by five millimeters to 55 millimeters and the compressor wheel by three millimeters to to 61 total millimeters. Overall, this is a pretty special machine. It's something that's effortlessly, insanely quick. And that's probably the most mind-blowing part of it. The speedometer can be reading double what you think you're going, and it all feels remarkably chill. It's fun to drive, and yet highly refined at the same time. 
If you're going to spend over $200,000 and drive something that doesn't look faster than everything around it, but is, and all in reasonable comfort, this is a pretty solid way to go about it. Thank you all so much for watching. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below.